All right. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we're going to we're going to get started now. Uh, I see we've got a very good audience already online. We've got it looks like uh, about fifty participants have joined us so far. Uh, we expect a few more uh, to make their way in, but we don't want to lose any time. Uh, we're conscious that everyone's made time to join us here on a Friday afternoon, uh, and we don't want to keep anyone late uh, away from from families and other things. Um, so let me kick off quickly. Uh, my name is Wilson Pritchard. I'm the executive director uh, of the International Center for Tax and Development, uh, and I'll be sort of facilitating and moderating the discussion today. So let me just briefly introduce it. Uh, as you all know, the topic of today's webinar is Ghana's e-levy, two months in, what do we know? Uh, the event is formally hosted uh, by the Digitax program of the ICTD, uh, which is a three-year research program funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, uh, which focuses on two sets of big questions uh, across Africa. Uh, the first is an interest in assessing the appropriateness and the design of taxes on digital financial services and its providers by understanding the impacts of those taxes on citizens and businesses and on the development of digital financial services markets more broadly. The second is in exploring the potential for harnessing the expansion of digital financial services across Africa in building more effective, fair, and accountable tax systems. And it's within the context of this program that this debate about the e-levy in Ghana is so interesting. It's interesting because it's been a very controversial, important policy development uh, in Ghana, which has raised really substantial, important, uh, often heated debates. Uh, but it's also uh, important beyond Ghana, because we know a lot of countries across Africa are exploring similar kinds of taxes. And so this is really an opportunity for us to learn more about the design of those taxes and their impacts in assessing what good policy moving toward the future might look like. The particular aim of this webinar, uh, which is really intended to be the first in what we hope will be a series of webinars uh, on this topic and hopefully involving many of you, is to begin a well-informed conversation, which is open to both a Ghanaian and an international audience, that allows for a better understanding of the goals of the tax, of the design of this tax, of the implementation of the tax, and eventually, and most critically, the impacts of the tax on different segments of society. But we're ultimately interested not only in what's happening in Ghana, but in also what that can teach other governments and stakeholders across the continent about the potentials and also risks of these kinds of tax policies. As suggested by the title in today's discussion, it's too early to assess all the impacts of this new tax. It was only created two months ago. So instead, our goal in this webinar is to take stock of the key debates surrounding the tax very quickly, to build a foundational understanding of what the tax is and what it aims to achieve, and then in turn to look in particular at what, seem, what we seem to be learning so far about the implementation of the tax, about how people are responding to it, and what are maybe some initial indications about its impacts. In terms of format, uh, we're going to begin with a short presentation uh, from the Digitax team just to introduce what the tax is, particularly for our international audience, so that everyone's familiar with the details of the tax. And then we'll move into a panel discussion with three panelists uh, from Ghana uh, who will introduce us to key debates about the tax and their initial impact impressions around implementation and impacts. That will then leave us 20 to 30 minutes at the end uh, for a question and answer session in which we'll invite questions from the audience. Uh, before I introduce all of our panelists, uh, just a couple of housekeeping uh, issues. So the first is for our audience. Uh, if you'd like to ask questions, uh, questions of our panelists, over the course of the discussion today, what we'd ask you to do is to click on the question and answer button, the Q&A button down at the bottom of your screen. That will allow you to write, write down questions. Uh, those will go to the moderators of this broader event who help to search through those, country, those questions in order to then allow me to direct them to our panelists. You may also get written responses to those questions. So that's another advantage of writing them down. And if there are questions we can't get to in the course of the seminar, we'll do our best to send written responses after the fact uh, as a follow-up uh, in order to keep this conversation active. Um, I think that's the key thing. Um, so before we get started, one last thing is uh, our organizers wanted to hold a short poll to get us started, just to gauge the level of familiarity in the audience about the Ghana e-levy. Um, so I think in just a moment, you should see that poll uh, pop up on your screen. Uh, we'd ask you to quickly complete that poll, uh, and then we'll get uh, directly into the proceedings. And uh, Mary, maybe you can give me a thumbs up when you think it's time for me to get started again. Okay. 
All right. Uh, so now let's get uh, get into the get into the action here. Um, so to kick us off, let me just introduce uh, the our speaker and then well our background presenter, let's say, and then our four featured panelists. Uh, so the, the initial presentation will be given uh, by Chris Wales. Uh, Chris Wales is an ICT consultant um, who's working as a senior research advisor uh, for the Digitax program. Uh, he's worked with prime ministers and finance ministers in many countries on economic and fiscal policy, fiscal institutions, revenue administration, labor market issues, and pensions policy. Uh, Chris is currently chairperson of the board of directors of the Rwanda Social Security Board, a member of the Council of the Institute for Fiscal Studies, and member of the advisory board of the Oxford University Center for Business Taxation, which he was instrumental in founding. Uh, needless to say, he's an expert on tax issues around the world. Uh, he's an ideal person, I think, to just give us an initial description of the design of the tax itself. We'll then turn to our panelists, and we have three wonderful panelists uh, who we're very grateful to for joining us here. Uh, first is Dorcas Ansa, um, who is the Accra Focal, Focal City Coordinator for WIEGO, the Women in Informal Employment Globalization and Organizing. Uh, she's leading organizational development as well as capacity and relationship building work for the membership-based organization and its broader stakeholders. With 15 years of development experience and a background in designing and delivering adult learning programs, Dorcas has worked extensively in facilitating processes, organizing development interventions, gender mainstreaming, monitoring and evaluation, as well as training and capacity building at many levels. Critically, the focus of her work is working with the informal sector, civil society, and parliament, critical actors in this discussion discussion of the e-levy, one of which goals was to strengthen taxation of the informal sector. Our second panelist is Benjamin Omoa. Uh, Benjamin is a senior lecturer at the Department of Finance, University of Ghana Business School, with over 11 years of teaching and research experience. He holds a PhD in finance from the University of Ghana. Uh, ben works as a lecturer in banking and finance at the undergraduate and graduate Master of Business and business administration level. And before joining the University of Ghana Business School, he worked as a lecturer at the Department of Banking and Finance at Central University for over 11 years, teaching both undergraduate and graduate finance course uh, courses. So again, critically relevant to the debates we're seeing around this tax on a variety of financial transactions. And finally, we have Abdul Karim Ibrahim, uh, who's a Ghanaian broadcast journalist and a final year MPhil candidate at the Institute of African Studies at the University of Ghana. He has close to a decade's wealth of experience in media practice at the forefront of policy analysis, advocacy, and civil society activism in Ghana and Africa. In his role as a radio show host and reporter, he's interviewed and engaged with state actors, development partners, civil society, and other policy actors across the security, education, human rights, health, legal, and other important sectors. I mentioned at the outset, the, the debate around the e-levy has been hotly contested uh, in Ghana. So we thought it'd be very valuable to have a journalist here to help give us a flavor of what some of those debates have looked like and how the public has been reacting uh, to this new levy. Uh, so without any further ado, uh, let me pass the floor to Chris Wales, who's going to kick us off with a short presentation introducing the tax, and then we'll move to our panelists. Uh, over to you, Chris. Okay, well, thank you very much indeed. Um, you're absolutely right. This is a, a, a very interesting topic. Uh, the tax itself, the design of the tax is extremely interesting. And um, there is a lot of material that we can talk about. There are a lot of issues that we can talk about. Um, my role, or at least my initial role this afternoon, is a very modest one, and that's simply to, to run quickly through the main provisions of the Act um, and make sure that we're all on the same page in terms of our understanding of, of what's included in the levy and what's excluded and what it's meant to do. So um, I expect to spend no more than five minutes on this, um, and then uh, we'll hand over the um, uh, the microphone, so to speak, to um, to those who will express some opinions about uh, about the levy. It is a very controversial levy, and it's quite different from some of the levies that have been uh, introduced, some of the taxes that have been introduced in other parts of Africa. Um, okay, let me not get ahead of myself, though. Uh, let's start with uh, the next slide, please, which uh, takes from the Act um, uh, a few 
key points. The act itself is extraordinarily brief. Um, you could say that it was eight pages, but that would probably be a bit of an exaggeration. It's, um, it's a little bit shorter than that, really. But it starts off by saying what the, what the purpose of the levy is. And it describes it very simply as to enhance revenue mobilization by broadening the tax base and providing for related matters, um, which is gloriously unspecific as, um, as legislation sometimes can be. Uh, it's clear from the structure of the tax, structure of the levy as we go through it, that it's primarily targeted on informal sector businesses and more generally on uh, people who use mobile money either in a um, either as consumers or uh, as members of families uh, passing money to other family members or um, or to buy stuff from um, from different kinds of merchants <clears throat> It's a tax which, um, as I explained in a moment, uh, seems primarily to target the users of mobile money rather than the users of bank accounts. Uh, usage of bank accounts is relatively high in Ghana compared with some, uh, uh, some countries in Africa, but um, uh, the tax leaves them much less touched than, um, than the people who rely extensively on mobile money. So um, next slide, please. The, uh, the legislation, as I said, is, uh, is really very short. It's available on the GRA website. Um, the, uh, the act received assent from, uh, from the president on the 31st of March and, uh, and was duly implemented on the 1st of May uh, this year. Uh, many of us had some doubts as to whether it would really be implemented on the 1st of May because that seemed hugely challenging. There appear to be um, many, many, many questions that had not been answered and which are certainly not answered in the legislation. But um, between the GRA and the ministry and, uh, and industry players, they, uh, they appear to have reached a method uh, of approaching the issues, which allowed it, in fact, to be implemented on the 1st of May, although it appears not without some hitches, but that's not my role to talk about. Um, a couple of key things, really, in relation to, um, uh, in relation to the legislation. Uh, it gives the minister powers to, uh, to make regulations for what it's called the efficient and effective implementation of the Act, which can mean almost anything. Um, and it gives the Commissioner General of the GRA uh, the power to issue administrative guidelines. So uh, there is a kind of a general health warning here that you can read this very short act, but don't expect to find out anything useful in it. Um, the, uh, in terms of reporting, uh, the, the act does say that the, um, the GRA will uh, will have to report numbers, um, the revenues at least from uh, from the levy, uh, on a quarterly basis to the minister, and the minister will, uh, in due course, report revenues twice a year to the parliament. Um, so there is a framework of reporting which will put this information into the public domain. And personally, I think that that will be very valuable. I think it'll be very interesting, um, not just in the early months of the levy, but as we go on to see uh, to see what the revenues are and whether they match up to the original forecasts or not. I suspect they won't, but this, again, that's the realms of speculation and I'm not going to go there. Um, uh, unsurprisingly, the the key act in um, in relation. Uh, sorry about that. Um, it always happens whenever I'm making a presentation. The um, uh, somebody calls me. Um, uh, and now I've lost the screen. But there we go. Um, the uh, the key actors in relation to uh, to the charging of the levy are unsurprisingly the intermediaries, the electronic money issuers, the banks generally uh, payment service providers, specialist deposit, you know, almost anybody who can make payments on, um, uh, on behalf of an individual or occasionally a business um, uh, in relation to the, uh, in, uh, well, through mobile money primarily. Um, uh, and the basis of the charge is, uh, is an electronic transfer um, I'll come back to that in a moment, but the levy is charged on electronic transfers and it's charged at the time of transfer. So at the moment at which um, the payment is made, the transfer is made, 
that's the point at which the tax bites and it's the role of the intermediary, um, the, uh, the institutions listed in the legislation to, um, to, uh, to make the deduction, to make the charge to, uh, to the customer. Um, next slide, please. So as I said, the, uh, the tax base for the levy is electronic transfers. Um, it doesn't apply to, um, to all electronic transfers, but it applies principally to transfers between mobile money accounts. It applies to transfers between bank accounts and mobile wallets and transfers in the opposite direction from mobile wallets to bank accounts. Um, uh, it will be understood in this that it applies to merchant payments, payments to, uh, to merchants for goods, goods and services, subject to some exclusions, which I'll come to briefly in a moment. Um, and it also applies to certain bank transfers by individuals. Now, when I read the legislation the first, second, third, fourth, fifth and sixth times, I found it quite difficult to understand what the uh, how, what the charge, how, what transfers the charge applied to in relation to bank transfers, because the legislation is, in my view, quite opaque. Um, it's been clarified a little by the GRA, and so we now have a better understanding. Um, uh, it will apply to, to certain bank transfers, but above a much higher threshold than, um, than those that apply, uh, than the threshold that applies in relation to, to mobile money transfers. The rate of the levy is one and a half percent on the value transferred, um, less a cumulative total of 100 cities per day. Again, the legislation is not crisp and clear in relation to exactly how that works. Um, fortunately, it has been clarified by the GRA. It's not immediately clear why um, uh, somebody who transfers 200 on one day and none on the next should be treated differently from someone who transfers 100 on each day. But there we are, um, that's opinion, and I'm not going there. Um, so if we just go to the next slide, um, the exclusions are, are very important. Um, as I mentioned, the, um, there is an exclusion for transfers up to 100 CDs per day by the same individual. Um, this is more complicated than it appears because there is a, a, a requirement for, um, for the individual to have registered the payments. And uh, this will come up, I'm sure, in the discussion, but it's not quite as clean a, uh, an exclusion as it appears. Um, the there is also an exclusion for transfers between accounts owned by the same person. So if I transfer money from my bank account to my mobile account, I don't pay the levy. Um, similarly, uh, transfers to make payments essentially to the government of Ghana on the Ghana Gov system um, are excluded from the tax. Um, and then, and this is this next point is one of the most interesting features of, of the levy, and I'm sure it'll be the subject of a lot of discussion now. Um, uh, payments to merchants who are registered for VAT or income tax are also excluded. And that's a very important, it's quite an in innovative um, uh, approach taken by the Ghana government, and um, we will see how it's working in practice. Um, there are also, there's also an exclusion for transfers between principal and agent. So if somebody is making a payment on your behalf, then that is excluded in principle from, uh, from the levy. Uh, the electronic clearing of checks is also excluded from the levy. Um, not quite sure why that's the case as a matter of principle, but, um, uh, but this is a, in most countries, this is a declining activity. And I imagine that's the case in Ghana as well. So it's perhaps not of such great significance. Um, the, uh, the act itself is, is quite silent about transfers between bank accounts, except for the reference to instant pay um, mechanisms within the banking system. And um, I've said here in the slide that they appear to be outside the scope of the levy. That's certainly true for payments made uh, by businesses, not completely true for individuals and anybody transferring above um, 20,000 uh, is, li is, is likely to be uh, subject to the levy. Interestingly, um, in the light of experience in other countries, 
the, uh, the levy doesn't apply to deposits into mobile money or to banks. Uh, it doesn't apply to withdrawals in marked contrast to, uh, for example, Uganda. And in spite of the references originally made uh, by ministers to inbound international remittances being within the scope of the levy, um, in fact, uh, as things have turned out, uh, those remittances are not caught by the levy. That may be an administrative issue rather than a, uh, an issue of principle, and ministers may have decided that it was better to, um, to, not, uh, uh, to not give rise to the kind of complications that that would otherwise give rise to. Anyway, um, those are the basic provisions of the Act. Uh, it's uh, it's a very interesting piece of legislation, both as a piece of legislation as, and in terms of what it introduces. And uh, it gives rise to lots of issues which I think are now going to be the subject of uh, what I hope will be a, a very useful and um, perhaps a little bit provocative um, debate. Thank you very much. Great. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Chris, for that terrific introduction to the tax, um, which uh, I'm sure will have put all of our particularly international participants a bit more clarity about what it is we're talking about here. Uh, let me pivot really directly now to our panelists uh, so we don't lose any time. Um, and we'd like to proceed into two parts. I want to first uh, go around uh, all three of our panelists in turn to, get them, to ask them to give us a brief recap, uh, particularly for the, the international audience, of some of the debates around the new e-levy, uh, after which we'll then uh, do a couple more rounds through our panelists uh, in which to ask them about implementation and reactions to the tax uh, since, it's, since it was implemented two months ago. Uh, I'm going to ask our panelists, uh, and I will say we warned them about this in advance, to try to keep their responses to uh, not more than about three minutes at a time. Uh, our hope is that will allow us to move then quickly through lots of different contributions and also leave some time uh, for questions at the end. And I believe Ria is going to help us uh, to keep time as we go. Um, so let me kick off by turning to uh, Abdul Karim. Um, we, uh, we know that the introduction of the e levy has been hotly debated uh, in Ghana, both before its implementation and after the implementation. Uh, so from your vantage point, particularly as a journalist, uh, we were hoping you could kick us off by providing an, a brief overview of some of the competing perspectives uh, that have been taken on this tax. That is, what have been some of the key concerns and arguments uh, of both supporters and opponents of the tax uh, during this early phase? Uh, over to you. Very well. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the opportunity. And, and so, yeah, I'll, I'll just go straight to it. Um, Ghana is obviously a very um, divided um, country. Uh, I, I don't know if you can hear me clearly. Uh, I'm not sure. Oh, great. Yeah, so, so Ghana is a very, very uh, divided country, uh, largely on policy matters along the two main political uh, parties, the ruling uh, New Patriotic Party and the opposition National Democratic Congress. But what you would interestingly always also find is a certain middle line or, or a group of, let's say, I mean, middle class people, academics, or people who do not necessarily belong to any of the two political parties to sometimes attempt to provide a balance. So I'm just going to try and distribute the, the broad arguments that we uh, journalists see on radio and as we interact with our audience and all of that. And, and they are going to be categorized are, are, are along the, the lines of the three different groups that I'm talking about here. What you would notice, however, is that in terms of the opposition, uh, even though generally there is a great dislike for the E-Levy, uh, supporters of the opposition party oftentimes go with the arguments that are advanced by their leadership. Supporters of the ruling party also usually go with the arguments outlined by, by, by them. And so let's start perhaps to go through uh, some of the arguments. So if you look at the government, for instance, the key argument that the government appears to be making is that uh, recovering from COVID-19 and especially also with the recent events in Russia and all of that, economic uh, challenges would require for us to find new innovative ideas to, to go about this. And so that's, that's key. And for that matter, the government says, for instance, it doesn't want to return to the IMF. And so it needs to, it needs to look within the local uh, space to be able to get more people into the tax net uh, to be able to get some more revenue and all of that. So that generally sums up the government's case that it is cash trapped. Ghana is struggling economically. We need to find remedies. How else are we able to do so? The, uh, the local digital market is rising by the day. And for that matter, there's some attention there. 
Your position basically summarizes the argument along these lines, that it's unaccountable, the government is unaccountable, the government has a tendency of overborrowing, and that the government also has essentially mismanaged the, uh, the, 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 the kitties of the state. And for that matter, we must look within to first and foremost deal with issues of corruption, seal the loopholes in the tax system, and all of that. And that if you are able to do all of these things, you would not need to overburden the citizenry again with extra taxes and all of that. So these form the broad ideas on both sides. But of course, there are some nuances there that when we get into the discussion properly, I would be able to tease out as to where, who stands, and how many people after implementation still believe that the, the, the E-Levy should not have passed at all. And some of the very deep-rooted uh, divisions that we have seen along the lines of the majority and the minority, to the extent that we even saw fisticuffs in parliament, uh, and, and a minister of state, uh, the sports minister, was injured uh, very, I mean, brutally, uh, according to reports that with a, a sharp object across his face. So these are some of the very interesting uh, debates uh, in, in Ghana and how divided it is on the subject of e levy Great. Uh, thank you so much, Abdul Karim. Uh, that's, uh, that's a terrific way to get us started. Uh, let me pivot now just really directly to, uh, to uh, Dr. Ben Amoa. Uh, from the University of Ghana, uh, no, not from the University of Ghana. Um, but uh, as a member of the research community, just big, we, we see that there are these public debates uh, playing out about the tax. Um, I'm wondering for you as a researcher, how is the research community in Ghana thinking about this tax? Sort of what are the big questions uh, that you're thinking about? What are the big questions facing this tax and trying to understand both its motivations, but also its potential impacts um, as we look towards the sort of next phase of debate around uh, yeah, around the e-levy. Uh, so over to you, Ben. Thank you very much. You know, the debate has basically been what has been the lessons with government revenue management in the past and what is it going to be going forward? So are we just adding up to government revenue collection just to waste it or we are going to have a situation where going forward, we'll be prudent in our tax management uh, aspect of our physical economic management. So if you look at the argument, this is how the arguments are coming up. But you see, we need to also look at the fact that the research community for now have concentrated more on what has happened in the past. Why? Because the e-levy is a new thing. And so if you want to go into e-levy now, you have to look more about behavioral intentions and also about what the likely effect will be on the digital economy. Because we shouldn't forget the electronic levy is riding on the back of electronic fund transfer. And this electronic fund transfer thrives on a virtual or digital economy. So now the argument is this, if you implement the e-levy, what are the likely impacts that it will have on the digital economy? These are some of the initial discussions that researchers are thinking about um, putting ideas together. However, because of the lack of empirical data, not because it's not being released, but simply because the implementation just started last month, May, the scientific discussions that should take place are yet to start. Of course, some research think tanks are doing some initial discussions an initial survey on e levy But the hardcore hard data from e levy to inform scientific discussions are yet to come. So now the discussion is more on, will it be used prudently, looking at past experience as far as government revenue management is concerned. And I believe that as the months roll out and then as more data is gathered, we can look at some more scientific discussions on the e-levy. Thank you. 
Great. Uh, thank you so much. And let me also thank both of our uh, panelists so far for staying so tightly to time as well. Uh, I, I think there's a the, there's an interesting point here, which I just flag for looking forward is this point about data, right? This is still early, uh, but part of why this is so exciting is we hope this is the first part of a longer discussion where we're sharing among researchers about what's happening. What are we learning about impacts? What does that tell us about this tax, but also the broader set of issues uh, across Africa? Uh, let me now turn to uh, Dorcas from Wiego. Uh, so Dorcas, you work closely with small and informal businesses. Uh, and we know that one of the goals of the tax, one of the expressed goals of the tax has been to broaden the, ta broaden the tax base and more effectively tax the informal sector specifically. Um, so what has been your perspective uh, and the perspective of your constituents on this new tax uh, and why? Okay, thank you for the opportunity. And <laughs> unfortunately, um, if I should start a, a whole discussion in, in, in using a word like that, Abdul really made clearly a good point, which was that the arguments around e-levy is divided among party lines. Unfortunately for the small businesses and informal sector, this is the only place that the two parties agree. For us, whether it's the argument of the minority or the majority, they always want to broaden the tax on it. And when they want to do that, the only group they always look at is the informal workers. And so for us, it's, it's, it's neither here or there. It's always targeted at the small scale workers, at the vulnerable workers. And that for us is the unfortunate part of it. Again, generally our perspective has been that the, this tax is another burden on the workers, on small scale workers, judging it from after COVID. Uh, traders, workers have lost their income. Now, what has the government done to support this group in even getting back their capital only for you to, again, task, tax what is left of them? So for them, they see it as a really another level of burden. One of the objective of e-levy is to broaden the tax net. And the argument from whatever side you hear, is that the informal workers don't pay tax. And I sometimes wonder where this comes from. Statistics have shown it. If you take, for instance, the municipal assembly, they are always reporting their IGF is contributed hugely, more than 75% by the market traders. And so what is that? When they go in, they pay daily tolls. They pay quarterly tolls, they pay property tax, they pay yearly tax. So what kind of tax again is the government wishing that the informal workers should pay that they haven't paid already? Both direct and indirect tax they pay. Is there any tax that they can highlight that the informal workers are not already paying? For them to have another tax that is broadly targeted at the informal workers. And why do we say that? I'm middle class. I have been able to avoid since its implementation. I've made it a point to myself that I will not do the momo. And I've been able to live without it for the two months that it's been implemented. All right, what about the worker? What did the Momo um, industry do for them? They had to go through cumbersome procedures to get bank accounts. With their, capacity, with their low level of capacity and all of that, it's been very difficult. Now, Momo came in easy. Now that is the target, all right? So it's, it's, it's quite a difficult conversation for them. They feel that the government and everybody's been very insensitive to them. The fact that they are they already, their capital is already um, 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 low from COVID and they are struggling with their capital. And so, yes, I guess they, we will have other conversations when we move on to implementation. Thank you. You on mute? 
Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dorcas, for that. Uh, I said at the outset that I'm not an expert on this tax, and, and I'm not, but I feel more expert now than I was. Uh, and we can see why this has been a heated debate. Uh, you know, a, a government searching for revenues after the crisis, you know, a financial sector worried about what will this mean for the development of digital financial services and the digital economy, and then informal sector workers who feel like more burdens are being piled on them at a time when they've already suffered through the pandemic. Um, and so we can see the heat and importance of this debate uh, and also the big research questions coming to understand those impacts more concretely, uh, to understand what's what's occurring from this tax. As, uh, as Ben has said, we don't yet know the answers to all of those impacts, right? We have people who have opinions about what they think the impacts will be, uh, well-informed opinions. Uh, we don't ne yet know. But because this is such an important issue, we also sort of want to track how this is developing over time. And so our goal for the remainder of the panel is to ask you about two things. The first is, how do we think implementation is proceeding? The second is, how have taxpayers been responding? Uh, and we'll take one at a time. And so starting with implementation, I think the key question that was raised by Chris in his initial presentation was, this is a complicated tax as well, right? This is a new kind of tax with a lot of administrative complexity around what will be covered, what will be exempted, and rules still to be defined by the GRA. So looking at how well implementation is working in practice becomes a really important question uh, as we look towards the future, and even as the government thinks about what's, hap what's happening right now. Um, so while we know we don't know all the answers yet, we're hoping we can ask our panelists to reflect on what we think we're learning already about implementation. And in particular, three aspects um, of implementation. The first has been the clarity and ease for taxpayers. Do taxpayers understand the tax? Is it easy for them to pay it? Or is this creating real challenges for taxpayers of understanding and payment? The second is around exemptions and refunds, right? There's a variety of kinds of payments here that should be exempted. And there should in some cases be refunds. Are those exemptions actually happening? Are those refunds getting paid? Or is it, are, perhaps is the tax ca capturing people we might not want it to capture? And third, do we see this creating difficulties in the use of digital services more broadly? Right? Is this complicating the use, for example, of uh, e-payments uh, with the Ghanaian government? Um, so again, we don't know all the answers, but that's what we'd like you to reflect on. Again, for about three minutes each. Uh, this time, let me start uh, with uh, with Ben, um, and then we'll pass to this to the other speakers. Uh, over to you. Thank you very much. So the issues are quite clear now. Uh, I must say that implementation has been very smooth. You know, from the first one week, there were a lot of issues about customers rushing in to, to cash out for fear of they suffering, you know, some form of tax for holding their monies on the wallet. But then the Ghana Revenue Authority came out to educate the public and to calm nerves. Again, there were initial glitches, I think, with the systems that were in place for the third course and the Ghana Revenue Authority. But I believe these things have been addressed. So now it is fairly easy. Once you do the transfer, the system picks the amount in excess of the 100 Ghana CDs and then the rates, the levy supply. The original fee for the telcos is now 0 0.75. So you see that clearly in the, what I'll call the fee advice. And then you also see the e-levy components charge on the transfer in the excess of the 100 CDs per day. So implementation has been largely successful. Uh, we have had less of issues of refund. Again, when the data comes out, they will may, maybe have the privilege of seeing the concerns of refund. In terms of clarity, I believe that it's very clear, transparency exists because once you just effect the transfer, the next thing is that you see the charge you see the fee going to the telcos, and you see the fee also being applied in terms of the e-levy. So there's smart transparency as far as the e-levy is concerned. In terms of overall intention, as to how it is impacting on the usage of electronic transfer, virtual business, et cetera, again, it's a bit difficult to, to speak to because we don't have the hard data. We don't have the hard data to speak to. So 
uh, but we need to be a bit patient. We have heard that there's always going to be a one month lag between the month where the telcos collected the e-levy, then another one month for the telcos to report to Ghana Revenue Authority. So we are talking about, let's say, 60 days or 30 days. So within that maximum 30 days, we will have the data coming out. It is from the data that we can tease out some of these details of the implementation of the e-levy. But I must say that it has been very smooth. It has been easy in terms of transparency, in terms of the fee. The usage of the funds is another discussion for another day. But in terms of collection and in terms of the response, I believe the, the government has done well. And then there are some toll-free numbers also available that if you are not clear about a charge, the government has made available some toll-free numbers that you can call for clarity. Its impact on electronic and virtual business digital economy, we still need to wait for some time. Thank you for now. Great, thank you so much. Uh, that was terrific. Uh, let's just quickly turn now immediately uh, first to Dorcas now. Um, just for your, for your take, uh, Ben's told us a, a fairly optimistic story about the smoothness of implementation. You know, has that been your experience? Is that the experience of the people you work with? Um, looking forward to hearing from you. Yes, I, I think that Ben has couched it very well. The implementation has been very smooth and I guess very simple. And for us, that opens that question for us. And not to digress, that the, the discussion around it is, when you want to collect tax, the system is so simple and all inclusive. However, when we need to receive what we are, we, we are due, then all the impediments are put in place. And a clear example, is the stimulus package the government had for the informal workers. They had to go and fill form on the internet. They had to do all manner of things to be able to apply for that. However, when it comes to tax, it's very simple. So the question for us is, is if the government can do things so simple like this, when they have to receive benefits, can this also be done so simply, period? Great, thank you so much, and and a good question. Uh, I, I suppose we might even ask ourselves, you know, does does having a tax like this with a broad reach also potentially simplify uh, support going in the other direction, uh, and and should that be part of the debate uh, around the tax? Um, yeah, a really interesting idea. Uh, let me now pass to uh, Abdul Karim. Um, so over to you, just to get your your perspective as well. Are you, are you hearing the same things about implementation? Are you hearing different things? Uh, over to you. Very well. So I think that on this, we perhaps all agree with uh, Dr. Amwa uh, that generally, uh, when it comes to implementation, I think that it's been fairly uh, uh, trouble free. Uh, what we noticed, especially for us in the media, uh, was that I think immediately after the, the implementation, especially uh, the first few days, uh, that is when we got a lot of complaints and uh, with many uh, raising their own issues. Uh, and then again, out of curiosity also, what we observed is that there are a lot of people who just simply want test, wanted to test the, the platform to see whether or not it was working properly. And, and based on that, I mean, the, the evidence available all over on social media platforms that we had mixed reactions, especially at that very uh, early moment. Um, City Newsroom, for instance, um, reported that uh, over this was as at May 16th, 2020. You know, it started implementation started in May on May 1st. Uh, and so after 16 days, over 120,000 people had been reimbursed by the GRA because deductions coming to them were wrongfully done. And I can imagine that the numbers will be more than this, but the only caveat or uh, nuance context I should provide is that a lot of these came at the very early stages. And so as we have moved on, uh, the, the conversation around e has died significantly in the Ghanaian media space. And so have complaints that we hear uh, in the media space also. But what we also know, very two quick things before I end here, according to uh, findings by Imani uh, Center for um, Policy and Education, they published their work yesterday, a survey that they conducted on the on e levy, and they still found that uh, it's 
are in turn uh, uh, people say that they have cut down on their or altered the volume of their transaction that they do on on these platforms and that's very significant over 80 percent are saying so and then again in terms of how much the government is accruing over the period whether or not government shortfall that uh, will have shortfalls and all of that the the director for research and a member of the uh, monetary policy committee of the bank of ghana uh, after a month also reported that government had made some 54 million ghana cities in one month so obviously government is making good money as dr amwa said we can only tell whether or not the implementation has been fully successful uh, whether or not it has met its targets after some longer time Great. Uh, thank you so much. And I'm going to thank our presenters again for being extremely good about keeping to time. Um, so thank you very much for that. Uh, let me turn to the third part of the discussion then. And actually, uh, you've just led us right into it, which is initial impressions about the impacts of the tax and how people are being affected. You know, there's lots of questions we could ask about that and feel free to pick, uh, pick what you think is most relevant. But let me flag a few things that I think are on people's minds. Uh, one is, are people changing their behavior in response to the levy? Uh, Abdul Karim, you've just suggested that they are. Um, so we can see if others see it the same way. You know, what are the deeper effects it's having on individuals uh, and, and sort of their lives through those through any changes in behavior or just the cost of the tax? Uh, what might people want to see changed about the tax as they're experiencing it now? Um, and then uh, critically, do we know anything about debates that are happening about how how the revenues might be used, about potential reform to the law, right? Are, are debates already starting about what happens next uh, or has that not quite happened yet? I know that's a lot uh, to get through in three minutes, but it gives you a bit of a menu of things uh, you, might want to, uh, you might want to dive into. Um, let me pass first now uh, to you, Dorcas, to kick us off uh, and then we'll go through the other speakers. Okay, so I think that the first for us is the deeper impact that is having on the workers. I think that is one that is an instant impact. So I have 100 CDs, I transfer it, this is the charge. Immediately I feel the impact. And the fact that informal workers, this is very unavoidable for them. Then it really affects their capital. For instance, um, one of the good parts of Momo is, that, is the security it provides them, particularly when they have to go and buy stuff that they have to sell or all of that. So they will travel without money. And this is good for them because initially you will be, you'll be met on the way by armed robbers and all of that. So now they move to wherever they have to buy their stuff and they are able to, to buy and then they transfer. Even if you get their phone, they still have their, their money intact because you don't have the code. But this is the case where if you get in there and you have to transfer such huge amount to vendors, then you're going to pay for that. So it's instant payment for them and it's, it's really affecting their, their, them individually. The second for them is just the, the end um, question, which is what are they going to get out of this? And like Doc said in the beginning, is it going to be used just as we have seen all other taxes that the government has ever discussed? If, and then the other question is, if they are targeting the informal workers, is there any plan of the government that targets informal workers in terms of benefits? And that conversation is not going to be had. And they gave an example when we started having the conversation with them that yes, they will talk about development. Example, hospitals. But when you get a, a hospital, it's a social intervention, okay. Now you get into the hospital, if you want to get this easy, you have to get NHIS. NHIS is not free. You have to pay premium. In effect, they are still having to pay for it. So what is really that they are getting out of paying sectors that they need to pay for? And if government says they are using it for development, what is it that, um, what difference does it make apart from what that they've experienced already? Yeah, so I guess for us and for the informal workers or the informal economy, it is really uh, dire on them. The, the impact is direct and they also don't see the end game, which is the benefit they are going to get from it, apart from the fact that this is really going to be a national thing. But again, we, we also 
not sure if they are going to um, account for it well. Great, thank you so much, Dorcas. Uh, let me move directly to Abdul Karim. Now, you've already said a little bit about impacts uh, based on data from this survey by Imani, uh, but let me give you the floor for a couple more minutes if there's anything that you'd like to add about impacts and any broader debates that you see emerging uh, about what, sh what should happen now or how money should be spent. Okay, so so first I want to talk about the, the question about usage and the uh, what the what how the money is going to be spent, the kinds of debates that we are we are seeing about that. And so quite clearly, um, between that period of implementation properly and when the government was doing its reverse consultation, because I say reverse consultation because that came in long after the debates had started and long after the government had failed on a couple of occasions to pass this in, in parliament uh, before you went out there to, to talk to people and, and all of that. and and. It is unusual in Ghana, but this, this time around, there's been a sharp reaction by government to try and create a sense of transparency. There are two things that are happening. One is that the Ghana Revenue Authority, the GRA, the agency mandated to, to collect the revenue, will be uh, presenting its report quarterly to the finance ministry, which would in turn present its report twice to, to parliament. And I, I, maybe Dr. Amwa may help us, but I do not know of any other thing like that as a journalist here in Ghana, where our government presents that kind of uh, report as they have decided. So quite clearly, it was in response to the general apprehension towards the, the e-levy and how they could get the buy-in of, of, of people. And so that element is more or less uh, addressed now. But of course, we haven't heard anything so far because we are still very early into this on quickly the the bit about effects and and impact um i think that what we are seeing is quite clearly like somebody like Dorcas has made a point that she has decided not to 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 pay at all there, there have been ideologues like that i started off myself as one and there are many others like that but eventually there was a time that i just could not do anything about it i needed to pay money and and, and i didn't have cash and i think that a lot of us complain about it but we have gotten so used to the electronics platform for a few years now that it's become almost impossible, especially for those of us in urban uh, center or people who do the kinds of work that Docas is talking about and all of that. But then you feel it more if you pay more. And that means that people who are doing business like Docas today, when inflation is so high in Ghana and life is generally unbearable for many, those people uh, are affected even the most in, in, in that case, because they can't always hold cash. Yes. Terrific. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, what, a, what a great discussion. Uh, okay, for the last word on this one, uh, let me pass uh, to Ben, uh, and then we're going to take a few uh, questions from our audience, uh, which I'll, I'll mediate to all of you. Uh, over to you, Ben. So, Dokas and uh, Karim have said much, and Karim took us to the heated debate that forced government to go through what we call the town hall meetings in an attempt to educate the, the public. And the fact that this time around, uh, twice in a year, the Minister of Finance will report to Parliament about how much has been accumulated. So thank you for the, the precursors. But then again, uh, if we look at the reasons for the e-levy, the reasons for the e-levy, in addition to the COVID reasons assigned by Dockers and then Karim, you can clearly see that the reasons predate COVID. If you are talking about youth stats, which is creating employment and entrepreneurship among the youth to curb unemployment, these are problems that existed before COVID. If you are talking about road infrastructure, it existed before COVID. If you are talking about uh, broadening the tax debt. It existed before COVID. So I'm just adding that these points are additions to what COVID has forced the government to, to do. Again, the concern about rising government debt is forcing government to shy away from you know, borrowing more and to look more into internal revenue to sort up government revenue. So this is just a background that the problems for implementation, just as uh, Wilson uh, said, 
are more of researchable and problem searching areas that we need to look into. But then what I would say is that government has promised transparency. So we can hold government to wait. Again, if you look at how the act has been crafted, if we can fall on our parliamentarians who led the charge and the discussion first to do what they did before the implementation, I believe that government will be forced to be more transparent as far as e-levy is concerned. It will definitely help the economy in one way or the other. It will help some other sectors of the economy. However, for that ecosystem that heavily depend on these transfers, especially the mobile money agents, the intention to move away from Momo transfers is a big threat to their existence. The data suggests that we have over 700,000 people employed within that micro money transfer space. And so if the intention is that a lot more individuals are going to move away from mobile money transactions, then we are heavily exposing these individuals to unemployment, which will then in another way tend to defeat the government youth start entrepreneurship initiative. So these are some of the issues that I believe we can talk about. Sorry, I may have lost track of some of the problem and recent questions you raised earlier on, but I believe they come up, I'll try to, to, to answer them. Thank you very much. Great, uh, thank you so much. And look, this has been terrific. I'm actually amazed by your collective ability to follow all the different questions I'm throwing at you and, and respond to all of them uh, so succinctly. Uh, I think just to, to summarize a bit, I mean, again, as, as the non-expert in the room, it, it seems that there's at least three really big questions uh, that are on the radar for all of you. I mean, one is what's happening to the use of digital payments? Uh, and if people are moving away, what does that mean for people? What are the costs of that? Uh, the second is about understanding who's bearing these burdens, right? Is, is this a tax that's falling overwhelmingly on poor people? Uh, if it is, is that the kind of tax uh, that we want? Um, and what kind of costs does that then have for people who are working at the margins and, and who are more vulnerable? Uh, and then third about what will be done with the revenue? It, are these transparency mechanisms gonna work in practice? Will the government be held to account? Where will we put these monies? Will those monies benefit those who are paying this new tax? Uh, and, and on down the line. Um, and I'll, I'll say for my part, I hope that not only is this the beginning of a discussion, but maybe also collaboration in answering those questions uh, with so many uh, terrific voices on this call. Um, for the last uh, 15 minutes or so, what we wanted to do was uh, allow us to hear a bit from our audience. Uh, in the online format, it's hard to do that directly. So instead, uh, I will moderate, but our audience has been putting some questions into the Q&A. Um, I'll remind our, our panelists and, and others, uh, you can always respond to those in writing in the Q&A, uh, but here I'll raise a few of those uh, directly to our panelists uh, to get your thoughts. Um, and let me start with one uh, for you, Dorcas. Uh, one of one of the people in the chat, and I think you saw this in the chat as well, uh, raised this question about, uh, you know, you've said that informal sector operators pay a lot of taxes, and you cited particularly taxes paid at the assembly level. Um, the, the question was about whether that was right or whether we should distinguish between taxes at the national level and then fees, tolls, rates, et cetera, at the local level. Um, so I'm wondering if you could say just a word about how we should think about that distinction between taxes and assembly tolls and rates. Um, and why it is that in your mind, we should think of the informal sector as, as bearing a heavy tax burden uh, effectively. Um, so over to you. Yeah, thank you. I think I tried to um, respond to Isaac in, in the comment, but trust, um, like I said, there are direct taxes and there are indirect taxes that the informal workers pay. So if we want to, in, in both cases, national taxes are VAT. Yes, they do pay. <laughs> they are not exempted. And then the local taxes, like, and he um, referred to income taxes, those are for them, they call it the quarterly payments, all right? So sometimes it's the terminology. Sometimes it is the terminology that the government gives it. So for instance, when they say informal 
economy or informal workers, what, did that, what does that mean? They bunch everybody into anybody who does their own job, they bunch into it. But it's very, very different conceptually when you're thinking about informal workers. So yes, there are taxes that are very direct to them, which they pay, and there are indirect taxes that they can't evade. And so, yes, they already pay taxes. Great. Uh, thank you very much for that. And uh, and I'll say this is sort of a pitch for the work of the ICTD. You know, actually, I think a lot of our work has tried to make a similar kind of argument, sometimes working uh, with WIEGO to highlight whether we call them taxes or not, the burdens that are borne uh, by by smaller firms and businesses uh, that we that often get overlooked um, when we have these debates. So I think that's, that's terrific to hear that part of this discussion. Uh, let me move to a second one. Um, Maybe I'll, I'll put this one uh, towards Ben, but if others want to jump in on this discussion, uh, please feel free to raise a hand. That's to our panelists. Um, so we have a question here that asked, would, it, would this tax be perceived as fairer if it wasn't just um, covering primarily mobile money payments, but if it was also taxing a larger range of, back, of bank payments as well? Because um, it seems like some bank payments are captured, others are not. Um, should we think of that as being unfair? Would it be fairer if, if it captured a wider range? Um, over to you. Thank you very much. The issue of fair and you know, in taxation will always come up for discussion. But then, uh, we, we need to realize that the bank, other forms of bank services or transactions also receive their own form of what I'll call indirect tax here. Because uh, what the government does is that at the end of the day, the fee incomes of these banks or financial institutions suffer some form of corporate tax at the end of the day. So for us to say that it will have been fairer or not, to be a very, a very difficult question for me to answer clearly. I'd rather say that the government's intention to broaden the tax net and the fact that from the government's own data, the informal sector that employs a lot is not contributing so much to the tax net is what may have informed the government to focus on the e-levy. Again, we shouldn't forget about the fact that, you know, uh, for the past 10 or 15 years, Mobile money transactions, volume and value have tremendously increased. And so the government has identified what I'll call a loophole or let's say a gray area that the informal sector is benefiting from. So there's a need to indirectly go in there to, to rake in some revenue. Before I end, I also say that in as much as we are talking about the indirect one, it is clear that some of the businessmen and women were using mobile money but not paying tax. So now they are being forced to register. And so directly, this pool of businesses have also been added to our tax pool. So yes, we have a lot of people complaining about mobile money. But then on the other side, when it comes to direct tax, there are a lot more businesses and individuals who have now been brought in, who will be taxed going forward. Thank you. Great, so I'll just flag that it's almost, even as we're talking, we can hear the debate playing out, right? Where the, and it's not so much that our panelists are disagreeing, but you know, the government has taken this, one way of understanding the focus of this tax is the government specifically wanted to target the informal sector based on a belief that they weren't paying their full fair share. Dorcas, of course, has made the case well, that's not right. We may we may think that that's right. The government may say that, but we don't think it's true. In fact, they're paying a lot. Uh, and then, of course, there's variation in the informal sector. There's some who are paying a lot, and others surely who weren't. And and I think one of the interesting things about research here will be digging into that to understand, you know, who's been paying what, who's now paying most of this tax. Is that the right distribution? Is it the right targeting? Um, complicated but important questions, uh, all of them. Let me let me turn to another one. This one uh, will go to uh, you, Abdul Karim. Um, so the question was, uh, you know, you'd mentioned, I, th I think it was you at the outset, um, that one of the motivations for introducing the tax was that the government was feeling cash strapped uh, as a result of the pandemic in, in part. Um, and so th that was part of their motivation for introducing this new tax to try to, to, try to, to fill that gap in revenue mobilization. The question from the audience was, 
was this the only big new tax that's been introduced? Or is there, have there been other revenue measures that the government has also introduced in parallel in trying to close that fiscal gap that emerged during the pandemic? Well, yeah, so that's, that's, that's a very interesting bit because that in itself has generated another uh, debate in the country. So the government, for instance, has for a very long time um, taken pride in the fact that it is a government that cuts down on, on taxes. And so any Ghanaian would know the famous or infamous 17 nuisance taxes as they, they characterize them. And, and so the government has actually re, I mean, removed a lot of taxes. But during the COVID-19 period, the amount of expenditure that came through relief items and many other things like that, which in itself is a subject in, in parliament now for some accountability over how the funds were used, one would notice that the, the, the government rather incurred more cost. And after the COVID-19, it has felt very difficult to be able to impose new taxes and all. So what you don't see is the introduction of new taxes. But what you see is the introduction of this e-levy for the very good reasons that uh, Dr. Amor has provided, because it is the lowest hanging fruit. It is easier to target and very easy to collect. You don't need to go through the same structural deficiencies with the Ghana Revenue Authority. The telecommunication companies are there. The systems are strong. All you need is to have a means to supervise what they are doing and to get your money. But government has in, uh, removed, however, the toll uh, collection levy or toll boot levy, as we call it. And, and those were also given the government some good amount. But the argument the government made was that, here, look at me. I am taking this burden off you, and I'm introducing this one that everybody is a part of. The toll levy was for only drivers at the, at the major highways. So it's like I, I, I take some away, and then I drop some in, but ultimately the goal is to take more from you. I have to say, I, I really like the way you, you put it at the end, and, and it raises this really interesting question that it, it's useful to see the Ghana e levy. It's a great question that was posed from the audience in the context of all these other changes. Because in some ways, ultimately what's happening is the government is moving the tax burden. Some people are having taxes taken off, others are having taxes paid on, and there are different arguments about whether that's the right thing or the wrong thing, uh, and being able to unpack, okay, well, why would we think this is the right thing to do? But is it really? Is that the fairest way of allocating the tax burden across different groups in society? Uh, I certainly can't answer that question, but I, I love the way this discussion is crystallizing that important question. Um, let me uh, let me finish with the last one. Uh, it'll be a quick response, but maybe let's uh, give a word to all three of you on this last one, but about one minute each. Uh, we, have a, we have a question from the audience. Uh, how optimistic are the panelists that the e-levy will be evaluated based on the evidence, given that uh, it has already become a political football? Uh, you know, we've all talked about the importance of learning more and gathering evidence about the impacts in order to then decide, is this designed appropriate? Is it having the impacts we want? Uh, how, how optimistic or not are you about the value of research and new evidence and then shaping what happens next? Uh, why don't I start with uh, Dorcas, then Ben, then Abdul Karim, uh, but each uh, very brief, please, because uh, people are gonna start disappearing on a Friday afternoon. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> can I be very frank? I don't think it's going to change anything. Because as we have said, implementation is going very well. What it will help, particularly those of us who will listen, is the fact that it will help us decide on other things, particularly elections. And I know that the next elections is really going to be hinged on this, is really going to be part of the conversation. But trust me, when the new government comes, this is not going to go away because it's good money for the government. So I honestly, it will help conversation, but I don't think it will help change. Great, thank you so much. Uh, that, that was a really interesting take. Uh, ben, over to you. Again, uh, ha, if you look at uh, the way government has managed revenue in the past, before the leakages and alleged corruption, then uh, one would not be far to, to say that uh, this is another pool of funds coming in. That stands the chance of being 
mismanaged. However, I, I believe that if we can get the opposition party to, to lead the charge, we can get civil societies to, to ask for transparency. We can pick the KPIs that government has set for itself. One, youth entrepreneurship support, road, construction, and then some interventions, and then use these interventions as the KPIs, and then track the funds and then the usage. And here, I will go for the civil society organizations to lead the chat because like Docker said, it's most likely that the political parties will drop the ball at a point in time. So if you can have the civil societies, you know, leading the charge and calling on transparency, the chances are that the government may be forced or politically will be forced to, to rethink the usage of these funds. But before I end, is it because it's an attempt to add on to the tax to GDP ratio? And Ghana is still yet to get to its peers in West Africa. There will still be the need to add on more tax. So it's all about adding up to revenue. But again, if the civil societies will help, I think we can force the politicians to be more transparent and efficient in using the funds that will mobilize. Thank you. Great, thanks so much. Uh, Abdul Karim, over to you uh, yeah. for the final word from the panel. Yeah, just, just to very quickly say that, well, uh, the UK apparently is not the only place with a bad government. We have a very, <laughs> very terrible government as well. And so I do not expect that anything significantly would change in terms of transparency and all of that. And particularly because the funds it appears are going to be used to do literally everything. So uh, it is going to be used for roads, it's going to be used for um, a youth entrepreneurship, um, campaigns and all of that. Because of that, one cannot properly descend, even though figures will be provided to us, which was used for what. So I don't look at that much. But very, very finally, um, Doc has talked about the fact that when the opposition comes, nothing will change and that they are all the same. What is interesting, however, is that the lead contender and the former president, John Dramani Mahama, for the opposition, has stated categorically that when the, the next, uh, I mean, they come into government, they are going to scrap the E-Levy. But it is interesting that Docas is saying that they won't change anything. And that is the reaction that I also get when I, I host my shows. People don't believe that they will change anything, but they have promised that when they come, they will scrap it. Remember talk tax. <laughs> well, yeah, they didn't, they didn't remove that. Yes, you are right. <laughs> uh, so, so this is look. This has been absolutely terrific. Uh, I'm conscious of the time. I know it's Friday afternoon. Uh, I've got strict instructions not to let us go over time. Uh, so let me say just a couple of words in in wrapping up. Um, the the first is just this has been a very interesting conversation. I think we see these critical issues. Uh, certainly for a researcher, they're really interesting issues to do research about. Uh, and I certainly hope and expect that that's part of what will, will come out of this first discussion. Uh, and then we'll hope that that research has some value, uh, despite uh, perhaps appropriate levels of skepticism about exactly how fully it will be used. Um, you know, but I think also when we think about this research, just to remind ourselves, and this is for the international audience, part of that learning is about Ghana and reform in Ghana or changes if they're needed. Part of it, though, is about learning how these taxes work at a time when so many other countries are also considering taxes like this and saying, what can we learn from this that will help other governments also decide uh, what they do? Uh, because certainly what we do know for sure from this discussion is this tax is bringing in a lot of money and it's easy to collect. And that's always going to make taxes like this attractive to governments. Um, the question, though, is, is it the right tax? Um, uh, and what can we say about that? So I think that's been very exciting. Uh, about the questions that people have asked, I'll just note for those who haven't been looking in the chat, there's been quite an interesting set of exchanges in the chat box uh, about how much money is being raised, about what the initial impacts appear to have been on the use of mobile money, how much that would evolve over time. So I'd encourage everyone just to have a look at that, that chat discussion, which is a very interesting one. Um, there's also a number of questions we didn't get to from the audience. Uh, as we said at the outset, we'll try to follow up in writing uh, with our panelists. Um, but beyond that, I'll then use this as a pitch for the next conversation. You know, this, this is an interim discussion. How did we get here and what do we think is happening so far? But the longer term goal is to get some of that hard data from that reporting that the act requires and then to begin to understand, okay, what exactly is happening? What exactly are the impacts? Can we quantify those a bit further? 
so we can make stronger statements about what's happened, whether it's right, whether it should be changed, and so on. Um, and we hope to have at least one more, but maybe a series of more events, very much like this one. I hope very much with the same group of people. So we're continuing to deepen this discussion, to learn together, to debate together, and to take what we learn in Ghana also uh, beyond Ghana uh, to our international participants. Um, so let me then finish just with a, an enormous thank you to, uh, to Chris for the introductory presentation, but most of all to our panelists. Uh, for a really terrific discussion and also for being so well prepared on time to allow us to have this vibrant discussion. Uh, we really, really appreciate it. And thank you also to our audience uh, for the wonderful questions uh, and for joining us here on a Friday afternoon. Uh, I think I'll wrap us up there. Uh, thank you so much, everyone. Uh, and looking forward to the next discussion.